Mm. That's okay. okay. Right, good morning everybody and welcome to those in attendance at this remote local review body hearing for Aberdeen City Council. Please note that this meeting will be recorded and published online for the public access after the meeting. Can all attendees switch off their mics, oh, sorry, or put their mics to mute. I'm quite content with the, the cameras to stay on because there's a limited number of us today. Uh, when you're not speaking, the camera and microphone um, or your microphone should be switched on when you're invited to speak. Guidance on how to do this is contained within the guidance issued to you. I will now ask the clerk to undertake a roll call of the members participating today for all members to confirm their attendance once their name has been announced by the clerk so that it's clear in the recording of the meeting and can also be recorded by the clerk in a minute. As you know, the local review body contains quasi judicial business. Members are reminded that they should not leave the room or meeting during consideration of any of the applications. Mark, could I ask you to do the roll call? Yes, thank you, Chairperson. Um, Councillor Bolton as Chairperson. I'm here. Councillor Henriksen. Here. And Councillor MacDonald. I'm here. Thank you. Okay, thank you all very much. Uh, the meeting has been convened in response to three requests for a review of the decision taken by the appointed officer under the council scheme of delegation. Members of the local review body have before them copies of the review documents as listed in the notice following the meeting. I will now ask Mr. Masson as the assistant clerk to outline the procedure to be followed to conduct these reviews today. Thank you. Members have the procedure note which was circulated with the meeting papers and is intended to set out the wider framework within which the review process operates. From this, it is clear that the first task for the review body is to come to a decision on whether the review documents contain sufficient information for the case to be determined without further procedure. And by that, it meant well, without further information or representations. To assist, I feel it would be helpful to mention the following. Firstly, that the regulations governing the local review process require that all matters which the applicant intends to raise in the review must be set out in or accompany the notice of review. Secondly, that the focus of the review should be on the basis of what was before the appointed officer when a decision was made and only in exceptional circumstances will new or additional matters be permitted to be taken into account. Thirdly, to note that the modernization of the planning system which included revisal of the planning appeal process, of which this local review body is part, removed the previous right on the part of an applicant to insist on a hearing and replaced that with the local review body, providing them with the power to choose a procedure which more accurately reflects the facts and circumstances of the individual case. And lastly, that guidance issued by the Scottish Government's Chief Planner in 2011 stated that reviews by local review bodies should be conducted by means of full consideration of the application afresh. This review should take the form of a structured discussion led by the chairperson to consider the matter set out in the notice of review before you. And I would conclude by drawing your attention in particular to points 10 to 12 of the procedure note. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Masson. Could I just take us to the agenda and, and get confirmation from both elected members that you have the procedure note at 1.1? Yep. I okay. do. Thank you. Um, and now turning to consideration of the first review, uh, review in respect of the decision to refuse the application for the partial change of use from office with workshop to restaurant class C with hot food takeaway including installation of a fence, a gate, associated work at Gratics House, Wellington Circle, planning reference number 191-800-CPP. We'll now hear from the planning advisor in attendance, Mr Gavin Evans, who will provide us with a brief description of the application proposal and a reminder of the reasons why the application was refused. I would point out that Mr Evans attends today's meeting to provide us with the necessary professional planning guidance because he has not been involved the earlier consideration of the application under review. Mr. Evans will not, however, be asked to express any view on the merits of the proposed development, and in effect, his role will be a neutral one involving the provision of factual information and guidance only. I have to pass over to yourself, Mr. Evans. Thank you, convener. Um, I'll just take a second to get the uh, presentation up here. <clears throat> Just ask everyone to confirm that you can see that on your screens. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Um, 
OK, so thank you, convener. Um, so as you said before us today, we have a request for review um, against a delegated refusal for detailed planning permission for the partial change of use from office with workshop to class three restaurant with hot food takeaway, including the installation of a fence with gate and associated other works at Graphics House, Wellington Circle, Aberdeen. Uh, the review was found to have been submitted um, with all the necessary information and within the time limit of three months following the decision of the appointed officer. Uh, there were no new matters raised based on the, the submissions in the, uh, in the notice of review and the applicant has intimated that they don't consider any further procedure is required in this case and that the LRB may proceed on the basis of these written submissions alone. Um, so just flicking through, um, give you a brief description of the site. Uh, site's located on the southern side of Wellington Circle, um, immediately opposite the car park that serves IKEA, um, Pure Gym and um, Starbucks. <coughs> Excuse me, as well as Macro, sorry. Um, uh, the Starbucks drive through sits within that car park, um, just directly opposite. Uh, immediately to the east is Wellington Business Park, which is a collection of smaller industrial units arranged around a central yard space with Lockside Academy located approximately 300 metres away to the northeast. Uh, the site itself accommodates a two storey pitched roof building, which contains a workshop and offices, along with associated car parking. The premises were historically occupied by uh, a company called XIC. Uh, they occupied the entirety of the building. Um, they're a commercial graphic design and printing company. However, it's understood from the applicant's submissions that XIC's demands for space have reduced over time, leading to part of the building being let out to others and a further area being unsuccessfully marketed for let since May 2019, with no viewings during that period. Uh, the applicant's statement in support of their application also highlights that the reception area at the front of the building is now redundant, with limited prospect of rental for business and industrial use due to limited floor space. Um, so just flicking through, that's the, the application site outlined in red here. And this is a, a street view image to give you an indication of the, the scale of the building. I'm not sure, can you see my cursor or is it just yeah. the dot? You yeah, can. You can. Yes. It's good. Um, so yeah, that's the that's the building that we're talking about here. Uh, access off Wellington Circle and car parking immediately to the front. Um, the site lies in an area that's zoned for principally business and industrial uses, where policy B1 of the local development plan applies. The land to the north, which includes IKEA, Macro, Pure Gym and Starbucks, is also zoned under policy B1, but is also included as an opportunity site designation in the local development plan, which identifies potential for change of use to class one retail uses. Um, come back to that slide in a moment. In terms of uh, planning site history, uh, the officer's report notes no planning history of note on the application site itself, but highlights two applications that were live at the time of consideration. <coughs> Uh, on, on nearby sites. These were uh, referenced 1915-88, uh, sought planning permission for the erection of two retail units directly opposite the site. Probably best if I show you this on the aerial view. And um, directly opposite the site, just in the, in the area in here. Um, sorry, yeah, between Starbucks and Ikea. Uh, <coughs> that application was subsequently refused in March of this year. Um, the refusal was not based on a conflict with the zoning policy. Um, it recognised the retail opportunity site designation um, and the refusal was based on design and visual impact grounds along with the loss of landscaped area uh, that's existing. Um, secondly, there was another application that was live at the time of the officer's decision. It was for the erection of a restaurant and drive through in a central portion of the car park serving IKEA, Macro and Pure Gym. Uh, that was approved in 2020 and um, consistent with the retail opportunity identified in OP 110. Um, it's worth noting that the, the refused application down here is still within its appeal period. So um, because that was a delegated decision, that could still come before the LRB. Um, so moving on to the proposal itself. Uh, 
these plans tend to have existing on one side and proposed on the other. Um, I'll just talk through those. Uh, so the application seeks detailed planning permission for a partial change of use uh, concerning, concerning the northern part of the ground floor of the building to allow for its use as a restaurant within class three uh, and as a hot food takeaway, which isn't within any particular class, as well as minor associated external works. Um, you'll note from the site plan there, members, that the uh, physical changes are modest. Um, those include the addition of motorcycle and cycle parking just to the, to the front of the building there, um, an external bin store to the rear, uh, and the demarcation of six dedicated parking spaces to serve the development. That's just shown over on this side of the sign. Uh, the ground floor plan, uh, sorry, that's just a zoomed in version of the, uh, of the proposed site plan. Uh, so that's the existing ground floor plan um, as proposed. So this is this front portion of the building that we're talking about. Uh, so the ground floor plan shows 26 covers along with the servery, kitchen and store spaces. Um, whilst there are adverts and signage shown on the elevations, uh, advertisements are covered by separate regulations. So these aren't within the scope of the application today. Um, and may need a separate grant of consent, depending on the specification. Uh, so, as I mentioned, the, the scale of changes is, is very minimal um, aesthetically. Um, really, we're just looking at the uh, the bin enclosure to one side of the building there, and that's the, the sort of rear elevation. Um, again, bin store is the only change on that elevation, and enclosed with fencing, and no change whatsoever in that. Um, so in terms of the appointed officer's reason for refusal, uh, they're stated in full within the decision notice in the agenda pack, but the, the main themes coming from that were a failure to comply with policy B1, business and industrial land, in that there's no requirement for this development and there's sufficient provision and range of food and drink establishments within the surrounding area to serve the existing uh, business parks needs. Um, in addition, the development due to its location um, was seen as potentially detracting from the vi viability and vitality of the existing city centre, which would be contrary to the requirements of policies NC4, sequential approach and impact, and NC5, out of centre proposals. <clears throat> in terms of the appellant's case, uh, a statement's been submitted in support of the application for review, uh, again, available in the agenda pack. Uh, that submission refers directly to the reasons for refusal and the main points are put forward as follows. Firstly, argues that policies NC4 and NC5 relating to the sequential approach and retail impact um, and assessment of out of centre sites are not directly relevant to this proposal because they apply only to significant footfall generating developments and it's contended by the applicants that this proposal is not a significant footfall generating development. Um, points out that policy B1 supports the proposed development as it would serve the immediate business and industrial area rather than a wider catchment. Also, it would bring an empty unit back into use, would enhance the attraction and sustainability of the business area as a whole, and would assist in supporting the applicant's existing business. Um, points out that the proposal is also supported by other local development plan policies as well as Scottish planning policies requirement that due weight be given to the net economic benefits of development. Highlights a lack of objection from consultees and counters the points made by NIG Community Council in its late submission. And lastly, highlights that the current supply of business and employment land far exceeds the requirements of the strategic development plan. Therefore, a change of use away from a business or industrial use would not have any, uh, any adverse consequence. In terms of consultations, uh, the Council's Roads Development Management team had no objection. There were no comments from Environmental Health uh, or from the contaminated land team within Environmental Health, though they recommended a condition securing assessment of potential contamination. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Aberdeen International Airport had no concerns on safeguarding grounds, but did recommend an advisory note on the use of cranes during construction. Um, as we saw, the extent of any construction is likely to be you know, limited to the, the fence and closing a bin store. So um, it's arguable whether that would be necessary, although it wouldn't do any harm given it's just an advisory note rather than a condition. 
And lastly, NIG Community Council objected to the application on grounds of road safety, traffic impact and over provision of food outlets in the area. Uh, they noted also that Wellington circles the main route to Lockside Academy and forms part of the identified safe route to school. Uh, there were no representations from members of the public for this application. Um, so at, th at that point, um, convener, I'll just hand back to you to determine whether you uh, members consider any further procedures required. Very much, uh, uh, Mr Evans. We now need to consider whether we have sufficient information in front of us today to take a decision on the application. Uh, members will note that the applicant has stated that the local review body should proceed without any further procedure before determination. Members, remember that if you feel you do not have enough information to take a decision, you can require further written information to be provided, hearings to be arranged, or site visit to be undertaken. Um, Councillor MacDonald, are you? I'm happy to proceed, Councillor Bolton. Okay. Uh, uh, Councillor Hendrickson? Yes, I'm happy to proceed as well. I'm equally content that we have sufficient information. I think that the pictures that have been provided um, in terms of maps, et cetera, I think is a good indication of it, where it is, and that there's been no request by the applicant um, for the So I think we're all content to go forward uh, on today to take the determination. Um, as members feel that the, they have the sufficient, sufficient um, information. We'll now hear from Mr Evans on the relevant policies and considerations for this review. Sir. Thank you, Convener. Um, just get this up again here. Oh, I think I'm sharing the wrong screen. It's all right. Uh, you've got policy B1 on. Oh, I do. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> thought I'd shared the wrong one. Uh, right. Sorry about that. Uh, so moving on uh, to the relevant policy considerations. Um, firstly, the zoning policy for this site is policy B1 relating to business and industrial land. Um, again, this relates to land which is zoned primarily for business and industrial uses and indicates that uh, such land will be retained for uses within class four, which is business offices, class five industrial and class six storage and distribution. Um, and safeguarded from other conflicting development types. There's a question there about whether members consider this is a conflicting development type. Um, it does allow for other uses which are suitable to business and industrial areas, as well as the expansion of existing businesses. And lastly, facilities that directly support business and industrial uses may be permitted where they enhance the attraction and sustainability of the city's business and industrial land but such facilities should be aimed at primarily meeting the needs of businesses and employees within the business and industrial area. The point there being they shouldn't really be serving a, a much wider catchment than, than that immediate um, business and industrial area. <clears throat> so moving on from there, uh, policies NC4 and NC5 relate to significant footfall generating uses and uh, set out the the hierarchical approach to directing significant footfall uses to either the city centre or another centre within the council's identified hierarchy of centres. Um, the idea being that we, we push the demand towards those areas. Um, so uh, these policies set out the sequential approach applies to the location of significant footfall generating development appropriate to town centres. Uh, the officer concluded that this development would not in itself generate significant footfall, but could divert trade when considered alongside other nearby developments. Um, so there's a question there about whether members agree um, that, that this use in itself would, uh, would attract significant footfall or whether you consider that there's, there's any sort of in combination effect with the other retail uses um, on the other side of uh, Wellington Circle there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there's a general requirement to locate such significant footfall generating uses within existing designated centres, i.e. the city centre, town centres, district centres and neighbourhood centres, which are listed in supplementary guidance. Policy NC5 sets out uh, a series of criteria that must all be satisfied um, for the location of significant footfall generating uses out with that network of centres. Um, 
So this, of course, won't be relevant if members consider that this isn't a significant footfall generating use. But nevertheless, the, the tests would be um, that no other sites are available within acceptable locations and designated centres, that no adverse effect, that there would be no adverse effect on vitality or viability of any designated centres, uh, that there's a qualitative and quantitative deficiency in the, a provision of the type proposed, and that the development would be easily and safely accessible by sustainable means, and that there would be no significant impact on travel patterns and the air quality. So, as I mentioned, there's a question about, first and foremost, whether you consider that policy should apply on the basis of the level of footfall, and then if you consider that it should apply, um, all of those criteria should be, should be met. <coughs> Excuse me. So, I'm sorry. Um, should perhaps have had that slide up at that point. Um, but I can come back to that if you, if you want. Um, so policy D1 uh, relating to design quality also applies. <clears throat> this requires development to be of a high standard of design, which demonstrates an understanding of its context and links to the uh, six qualities essential to good placemaking. Um, that development be distinctive, welcoming, safe and pleasant, easy to move around, adaptable and resource efficient. Obviously, we're dealing with uh, the adaptation of an existing building here, so there's little change in the physical environment. It's it's really just the nature of the use. <clears throat> Other relevant policies, um, which are perhaps less central, um, are policy T2 relating to managing the transport impact of development, policy T3 encouraging sustainable and active travel, and policy B4, Aberdeen Airport, which just relates to safeguarding criteria around, uh, around the airport and, and within safeguarding zones. And um, also the supplementary guidance on transport and accessibility. In terms of uh, other material considerations, uh, Scottish planning policy has a high level commentary on the importance of sustainable economic growth, using resources more efficiently and effectively. And uh, sorry, strategic development plan has that. Um, Scottish planning policy indicates that due weight should be given to the net economic benefits of development. So in summing up, uh, key points of relevance for members. Uh, firstly, the zoning. Do members consider that the proposed use is permitted under the terms of policy B1? Um, I.e. would this development enhance the attraction and sustainability of the city's business and industrial land? And secondly, would it cater principally to the needs of the business and employees, businesses and employees within the surrounding area, or would it serve a wider catchment? Um, in terms of retail impact, do members consider that the proposal represents a significant footfall generating development appropriate to a town centre? If so, policies NC and N4 apply, and then bring in criteria of their own. And in relation to design, is the proposal of sufficient design quality? Again, um, very little. Uh, change externally. Um, so really concluding, uh, coming to a, a, a conclusion on whether the proposal complies with the development plan as a whole, and then if uh, the proposal doesn't comply with the development plan, are there any other material considerations that might weigh in its favour? Um, happy to assist with uh, conditions if members are minded to approve, um, and I'll just hand back to you there, computer. Thanks very much, Mr Evans. Um, Members, questions for Mr. Evans. Uh, uh, Councillor Hendrickson. Yeah, um, I just wondered whether um, the impact on um, the footfall from Lochside Academy at lunch times had been is is a consideration because I would. I'm just wondering whether that would have actually generated a large number of uh, uh, amount of footfall within the area with the children actually going to it depending on what kind of um cafe they actually or restaurant they decide to open yeah um i think the the location of this building relative to lockside academy is such that um it could potentially be serving um pupils attending the school um there's no quantified sort of assessment of um you know the number of pupils that it might attract and like you say, that's probably largely dependent on the nature of the use and its its appeal. Um, what can be a relevant material consideration in assessing planning applications is uh, the location of 
um, the sort of health impacts, if you like, of locating certain types of hot food takeaways and things like that around schools. Um, although it's it's quite a sort of difficult area to get into because um, we're looking really at use classes, which are painting with quite a broad brush, whereas and it, it doesn't really take into account the exact nature and type of food that people might be serving, if you see what I mean. Um, any other questions, Councillor Henderson? Uh, no, Councillor McDonald? Yeah, I noted from the papers that there hadn't been any um, decision from the applicant about what type of, um, of food outlet might be proposed and uh, they hadn't secured anyone, I suppose, to, um, to to move in in a way. But um, and just following on from um, Councillor Hendrickson's um, question, um, when in any planning um, application does that become a material consideration? Um, because it is it is something that that did exercise me when I was reading through the the, the papers. Mm -hmm. um. Well, really, it, it can be a material consideration where we're talking about the likes of hot food takeaways close to close to schools. Um, an applicant doesn't necessarily have to specify exactly what it is they're going to do with the use other than to just say hot food takeaway, so generous, not within a use class. Um, so that leaves us in a little bit of a difficult position um, in terms of how significant we consider that to be as a factor. Um, the use of conditions, for example, on the limiting the type of food that might be sold, I think would be in questionable territory. Um, so I really, you have to sort of think of a worst case scenario and think about, you know, the, the range of options that might be available under the planning permission and um, going from, you know, the, the less concerning to the more concerning. And following on from that, can I ask through you, convener, um, there are premises and certainly macro, although it doesn't have a cafe, doesn't allow um, anybody under 16 to enter um, without being accompanied. And um, just in terms of, of guidelines for any particular business in the area, um, is that something that is, um, is done under planning regulations or is it just a policy that the um, any particular company might have about you know only two um or you, you see it in some other places only two um school children in at one time can i can i just ask um if that's yeah. the case um i think that would just be a store policy or a company policy it wouldn't be the sort of thing that i think we'd be able to to mandate under under planning conditions thank you okay. um i've got a couple of questions um uh, sir evans in terms of um obviously the the community council raised concerns over road safety and the fact that it was a safe route to school um, route. But our roads colleagues haven't raised any concerns and it wasn't a reason that was given to refuse this application. Um, can you maybe just elaborate a little bit around that? Yeah, um, I mean, in their assessment, our roads colleagues would have been looking at the relative number of vehicle journeys that this use might be likely to attract and comparing that to its proposed it, sorry its former use mm -hmm. as a sort of business or industrial slash office um use so if there was no net difference or if there's no net increase in the number of vehicles then they'd just probably be uh, as i understand it looking at that and saying well there's no change in terms of the the nature of the traffic so so there wouldn't be any reason for them to be concerned about that yeah, as I, I suppose it's because in the you know you've got people turning up in the morning when children would be going to school anyway to the office and leaving probably around those sorts of areas. Um, how, can you remind me how many covers did they suggest you were having, Mr. Evans? Oh, uh, I think it was twenty six. Just double check that. Twenty six, I'd counted just from the layout plan. Yeah, and um, the other question was. When did you say they had marketed this for um, an office space? No, I remember the 2019, I just forgot the month. <laughs> yeah, I've got it down here as since May 2019 with no viewings in that period. Um, okay. That's obviously for the, the currently vacant part. There is another bit that they managed to lease off to, to another company. Okay. 
and there's obviously no comment in from the existing tenants of the building. From no, my I don't believe so. Um, can I ask through you, convener, um, just just a thought, were there any timings suggested for the opening um, of the the restaurant and hot food takeaway? I, I can't remember seeing in the... I, I haven't come across any in the submissions myself, no. Um, generally, we'd be looking at uh, hours of operation if there was a particular concern about residential immunity usually. So because because of the context, that's that's probably less of a concern. Has anybody else got any further questions for uh, Mr. Evans? No. Um, Councillor McDonald, um, do you feel in the position, having had your questions answered and heard, heard the relevant policies, it, to be in a position to discuss and determine this application? Yes, I do, um, convener. Um, do you, do you want me to go ahead? Yeah, please, yeah. yeah. Um, um, my view um, is that um, I, I would want to uphold the officer's um, decision of refusal in this case, um, particularly um, on the, the first policy that was mentioned, the B1 um, zoning policy. Um, and um, I, I do understand in NC4 and NC5, there, there isn't um, um, a huge amount of football that might be... Um, um, attracted to the site, but um, I think it would really have, um, you know, the, an impact on on um, uh, vibrancy and, and vitality of, of, of other businesses. Um, and whilst the, um, you know, the, the place, you know, the, the whole application itself is not um, changing the, the the nature and the view of the um, the building uh, as it is, um, it's it is quite a a, a strong um, building in it in itself, and uh, um, so I'm, I'm not so sure about the D1 policy, but certainly on on the others, I would be um, upholding the officer's decision. Thank you, Councillor McDonald. Councillor Hendrickson. Um, I would have to agree with Councillor McDonald there. Um, there's not really much more that I can add to that. Um, my main concern was it, 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 it's the potential of. Um, depending on what kind of uh, cafe or restaurant it's going to be, the attraction of, of the, the lockside pupils to, to the area. And um, I know that we, we, we can be quite concerned about the types of food that they're actually um, consuming at lunchtime. Um, so that's one concern that I have about it. But I think the, um, the other policies and the reason for refusals are valid for me. OK. Um, I found it actually quite a, an interesting application and, and, you know, I could see how it could um, go either way um, on this purely from the point of view, I think that there, you know, if you look at it in a positive light, um, it had, it would be putting back into use um, an empty part of a building. Um, we have significant offices around that area, so people being able to walk out to, to the restaurant or take away at lunchtime. Uh, where they might not be minded to go away or cross over to the other side to, you know, who mentioned the hotel and things like that. Um, you know, I do obviously have um, a concern that we've already got a planning application approved for IKEA for a, a restaurant type um, offering, which requires a building to be constructed. Yet we've got a building already existing, which could actually be be utilised. So, you know, there's lots of different um, kind of uh, machinations that are going through my mind around this. Um, just looking at the proposed site plan, one of my concerns would be, depending obviously on what kind of, of um, takeaway it did provide, and people particularly attracting school pupils, is the access in, which just from the drawing would appear to come in through the car park, you know, and then you have the conflict of people coming back and forth through the, con the, the, the car park. And whilst, you know, there is cars there, you know, I think that the opportunity to attract maybe young people might, from school, you know, I can concur with the community council's comments about fear of there being a safe route to school and, and that conflict existing. So I think on balance, um, and, it, you know, and I think it's an on balance application, you know, I would obviously go with my two colleagues, 
um, and the officer's recommendation. As I say, I, I, I can see merits to this. But I think, you know, given the other issues that we have, I think we need to um, I think down the side. My, I would agree with yourselves on the side of the determining officer and uphold the officer's recommendation. OK, so if we could just uh, I think just for completeness, if Mr. Masson, could you just do a, a simple um, call for um, our views just so that we've got it recorded? Of course. Um... Councillor Bolton. Um, so um, all three um, members um, have indicated that they are upholding the officer's recommendations to refuse the application um, in terms of uh, policy B1 and um, policies NC4 and NC5. Yeah, I agree. I agree with refusal. Intentionally. Agreed. OK, thank you very much, everybody. If we could now turn to consideration of the second review in respect of the decision to refuse the application for the erection of a two storey extension, including first floor terrace with carpet um, below, installation of a replacement garage to the rear, formation of a new window opening to the rear gable, installation of a replacement window at the upper floor, alterations to the boundary wall and landscaping fronts in front for, in the front cartilage, get this right, to create a garden area and parking space at 16 to 18 Fountain Hill Road. Uh, planning reference number 191169 DPP. We will now hear from the planning advisor, Mr. Gavin Evans, who will provide us with a brief description of the application proposal and a reminder of the reasons why the application was refused. I would again point out that Mr. Evans attends today's meeting to provide us with the necessary professional planning guidance because he's not been involved in the earlier consideration of the application under review. Mr. Evans will not, however, be asked to express any view on the merits of the proposed development and effect. His role will be a neutral one involving the provision of practical information and guidance only. Mr. Evans. Thank you, Convener. Again, just get the presentation up here. Can you everyone see that okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you, Convener. Um, yes, so uh, the second case today is a request for review against an application refused under delegated powers for the erection of a two-storey extension, including first floor terrace with carport below, installation of replacement garage to rear, formation of new window opening and rear gable, installation of replacement uh, windows at upper floor, and alterations to boundary wall, as well as landscaping works in the front cartilage, cartilage to create a garden area and parking spaces. And all of that's happening at, or proposed to happen at 16 to 18 Fountain Hall Road, Aberdeen. Uh, again, this review was found to have been submitted uh, with all necessary information and within the time limit of three months from the appointed officer's decision. Uh, the applicant has indicated on the notice of review that new matters have been raised in the review submissions. Uh, these are four letters of support from the local ward members who would previously have been, um, well, the, the, the argument put forward is that they would have been previously prevented from expressing support um, at the time of the application as this may have precluded them from participating in the decision making process. Um, we also have uh, some additional colour visualisations. However, it's understood that those were provided at the time of the application and just not uploaded to the website. So we're happy to accept those. Um, at this point, I'll just ask our legal advisor, Lisa Christie, to offer some guidance on the tests that apply to the introduction of new matters in the review process. I could ask you to um, jump in there, Lisa. Yes. Uh -huh. um, Yes, convener. Um, under Section 43B of the Town and County Planning Scotland Act 1997 as amended, a party to proceedings is not to raise any matter which is not before the appointed person at the time the determination was reviewed, um, the determination review was made, unless that party can determine a that the matter could not have been raised before that time, or b that it is that, that it's not being raised before that time was a consequence of exceptional circumstances. 
Um, in relation uh, to the let letters, um, I could give some um, further advice um, in relation to the reason given by the applicant, if if um, yes, please. Is, convener. Yes, please. Um, in relation to the letters, convener, the reason given is that letters could not have been provided earlier because to publicly state support would have precluded those members from the decision making process in the event that the application was referred to committee for determination. In this case, convener, um, the uh, advice um, on this matter is that um, it would be inadvisable to accept the letters in. Um, the reason um, we would uh, give for this is that um, it wouldn't meet either of the tests and um, members um, could have made um, their representations to the planning authority as part of the normal planning process in the same way as any other interested party you know at the start of the process and ward members would have been um, would have been told that a planning application was happening in their ward um, so as this was a local application those who had um, made representations would have never um, been asked to decide on it anyway, um, because in an um, because ward members don't, you know, participate in LRB appeals in their ward, and the proper way would have uh, been for um, members to put in their representations at the start um, as part of the planning process, and um, given that they would have been notified. So the advice is that. Um, don't uh, that um, the let, letting letters in um, would not meet the two tests. Thank you very much, um, Lisa. I mean, I, I would concur. I feel that um, as elected members, we have to make decisions on where we want to support things, which could preclude us from taking part in decisions, um, and we, we face that on a regular basis. Um, and I think that uh, they, they have made a choice. Um, not to have made representations earlier on, um, and I think that it would jeopardise any decision we made to accept it if this needs to break that agreement that we won't accept those. So obviously, this the, the drawings had already been provided, but just hadn't been loaded up to this. I think it's okay. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Um, so I'll just get this presentation back up on screen. There we go. Uh, so uh, in terms of the procedure by which the review will be conducted, um, the applicant has expressed a view that a site visit should be undertaken in order to allow members to appreciate the site context. Um, I'll provide some background to the case before I hand back to you, convener, for members to determine whether they, uh, whether they want to go ahead with that. Um, so in terms of description of the site, <clears throat> um, this is at pages 82 to 85 of the agenda pack, um, or these slides are, sorry. Uh, the property in question is a detached three-storey granite villa, which contains two separate flats. Uh, the building fronts onto Fountain Hall Road with its side elevation onto Fountain Hall Lane, which you can see there then dog legs around the back to serve the, the rear of these properties. Um, the ground floor flats access to the front uh, with a, a further door in the side elevation providing access to stairs that serve the upper flat. Um, so got an aerial view here as well and uh, street image that's taken from uh, just Google Street View that's dated March 2019 and um, so you can just see the, the door to the upper flat there so that goes straight into some stairs. <coughs> Uh, on the other side of the uh, the lane, uh, just here, which just out of shot in this image, is uh, Blenheim House, a modern office building. Um, there are three existing garage buildings within the plot. Uh, if I can just flick through here, you can maybe see those better. Uh, so if you can see my cursor on the screen there, um, there's an existing garage just here, uh, another one here, and then one in the corner of the site accessed off the rear lane as well. Um, <clears throat> so as I say, all of those are accessed via Fountain Hall Lane, uh, one directly adjoining the rear of the house, one abutting and sitting parallel to the southern boundary, and the last one sitting in the northeast corner of the site. Uh, the area to the front of the property is laid hard standing. I'll just flip back to the street view image and you can see that for yourself. 
Um, so yes, the area to the front is laid hard standing and enclosed by hedging, whilst the rear garden is enclosed by a granite rubble wall, which you can just see here running down, running down the side of the property. Um, traditional granite lean-to outbuildings are present on the northern boundary, just a quick shot to the rear of the property there. Um, and the site's located in an area the local development plan identifies as an H1 residential area. Uh, it also lies within the Albine Place and Rubislaw Conservation Area. In terms of planning history, I'm just staying on this screen, um, a Certificate of Lawful Development was issued by the Planning Authority in January of this year for works to form hard standing in the front garden. Um, so that's the formation of this, this hard standing here. Certificate of Lawful Development or use is essentially uh, a certificate that the Planning Authority can issue to an applicant confirming that because works were done for example so long ago that they're now immune from enforcement action they are now deemed lawful uh, there's various routes to lawfulness but one of them is that unauthorized works were done uh, more than four years ago and therefore they can't be enforced against by the planning authority so that's that's the situation with this hard standing at the front so uh, it was done without planning permission but it's nevertheless now authorized so there's there's nothing that can be can be done about that it's as if it has planning permission um, so moving on to the proposal and the description of that itself, um, this is an existing and proposed site plan. So you can see um, the rear extension here in this right hand image, as well as the replacement garage, which offers uh, occupies a, a similar footprint to that which it replaces. Um, um, so detailed planning permission is sought for. Oh, sorry, uh, there was a correction that I meant to, to add there, sorry. Um, just on the proposed ground floor plan, which is shown in the agenda version of the slides, um, this was a, this was an earlier copy of the plan. So uh, just this image here. So what I'm showing here is the corrected version, but in the agenda pack, I had erroneously used an older plan. So um, that's been brought to our attention. So just to, to make clear that what's before you now is the correct view. The, the, the difference in that plan, just for, for reference, was at the front garden where uh, this area of soft landscaping was increased in response to the, uh, the officer, some concerns raised by the officer. <clears throat> so detailed planning permission sought for the erection of a two storey extension to the rear, which includes a terrace at first floor level and carport below. Um, both the roof and walls of the extension, if I just flick through here to the elevations perhaps, um, can't see terribly well, can perhaps zoom in. Um, so both the roof and walls of the extension would be clad in a natural slate. Um, the plans show a hexagonal sort of slate unit um, with black painted vertical timber cladding on the gable elevation. Uh, that's just here. Um, and, and the balustrade, which encloses the sort of balcony area. Uh, windows would be in black aluminium um, uh, as would doors. Um, there's also the installation of a replacement garage to the rear, which you can just see in this part of the image. Um, that would be 6.5 metres deep uh, with a pitched roof, measuring two and a half metres to the eaves and four metres to the ridge. Um, finished in, again, black vertical timber cladding to match parts of the extension with a profiled metal roof. Uh, we also have the formation of a single new window opening in the rear gable. That's this window just up here. Um, so that's at second floor level and would be a timber double glazed sash and window, uh, sash and case window, excuse me. Um, as well as that, the proposal includes the installation of replacement windows at the upper floor level. So that's replacing UPVC windows as existing with timber sash and case. <clears throat> uh, there are also alterations to the boundary wall. Um, i just flick back. So there are alterations to the boundary wall uh, you can see on that lower image there in order to form these uh, these larger gates. Um, 
There's also reconfiguration of the area to the front of the building to create landscaped garden and parking areas uh, in place of what we'd seen from the, the street view photograph was just entirely hard standing. So um, what you can see here is that an area of soft landscape front garden has been reinstated uh, as well as sort of continuing along, along the frontage to, to soften and enclose the, uh, the off street car parking. Uh, there's also new railings proposed at the side of the house onto Fountain Hall Lane. Uh, those are black painted metal railings at low level. Um, just flip through again. Sorry to go back and forth on these <laughs> slides. You make my eyes go funny. <laughs> uh, so that's that's the area of new railings just being installed there at the side of the property. Uh, the officer's report notes that there was a, a lack of detailed specification, but uh, the principle of those railings being introduced was accepted and notes uh, a view that the specification might readily be conditioned um, in the event that OZO was being supported. Um, so I'll, I bounced around a bit there, so I'll perhaps just go back to the start and flick through these um, a little more slowly. <clears throat> so this is the existing and proposed ground floor. Uh, so as existing, you can see uh, the, the Sort of whole front garden was laid hard standing, so now you have that that uh, reintroduction of uh, soft garden space. And um, we have the railings being introduced along this section down here in the lower image. Um, and this is the carport. You can just see this dashed line denotes the uh, the part of the extension that would oversail that carport. Um, and other points of note: uh, there's an existing outbuilding here. Uh, well, a series of outbuildings and sheds that run along the boundary and um, what's proposed is that this uh, leftmost and largest one be incorporated within the body of the extended house as a sort of study um, and then the other the other parts just be retained as as outdoor shed garden storage sort of thing and um, you can see that the proposed garage is of a similar sort of footprint to what's being replaced and there are various um, Sort of alterations to the interior of the garden, but that's not within the scope of uh, scope of our assessment. Um, so, flicking on to uh, existing and proposed first floor level, this gives you an indication of the the scale of the extension out to the rear. And uh, on the lower image there, you can see the terrace area, which is enclosed by the sort of black timber balustrade that we saw uh, in the earlier elevations. Uh, second floor plan, I don't believe there's any change whatsoever in the second floor plan and um, this really is just showing you the roof of the, of the new extension as it as it wraps around that, that existing rear, rear offshoot to the property. <clears throat> and uh, again, this, this is just the roof plan. You can see that the orientation of the garage has changed, but there's no there's no particular concern highlighted about that in the officer's report. <clears throat> um, front elevation, very little change really, um, because the uh, the works are really largely taking place to the rear of the property. The only change would be in the in the sort of reconfiguration of the front garden. And this just sort of shows you the, the scale of the property and its relationship to the neighbouring office building. Uh, this is a view from uh, Fountain Hall Lane to the rear. Um, so as existing on the top image, that's the existing double garage, and then this is the garage which would replace it. Not terribly clear because the the detail of the roof sort of um, blurs a little bit against the uh, the balustrade detail for the um, for the extension. Sorry. Uh, so this is the this is the view to the adjoining property, or sorry, the neighbouring property. You can see the extension, and uh, as I mentioned, the uh, the sort of hexagonal slate cladding that's proposed to be used on the uh, on both the roof and on the walls. Um, worth noting as well the the manner in which the extension wraps around this rear offshoot. That seems to have been a a particular issue of concern in the officer's report. And this is a change from the side elevation just onto Fountain Hall Lane again. 
So you can see the new timber gates introduced uh, significantly wider in terms of allowing access uh, to the to the sort of undercroft car court and the existing opening. Um, the detail of of excuse me uh, making good any opening uh, would be would be something to be considered carefully in the event the members were minded to support just to make sure that the, the opening is built up using appropriate materials, appropriate methodology. So uh, I can come back to those um, as needs be. Um, so turning to the reasons for refusal, um, these are stated on page 96 of the agenda pack. Um, main points being the proposed extension was seen as being not suitably, sorry, it was considered that the proposed extension would not suitably respect the scale, form and character of the existing historic building, um, that it would therefore have a detrimental impact on the character and amenity of the Albine Place and Rubislaw Conservation Area. And as a result, the proposed, or sorry, the proposed development would be at odds with policy H1, residential areas, policy D1, quality placemaking by design, and policy D4, historic environment of the local development plan, as well as the relevant sections of Scottish planning policy and historic environment policy for Scotland. Um, in addition to historic environment Scotland's guidance, uh, managing change guidance. The scale of hard surface landscaping, including car parking in the front cartilage was seen as being to the detriment of the character of Fountain Hall Road, um, especially the area between Fountain Hall Lane and Deswood Place. <clears throat> it was therefore seen as being detrimental to the character and amenity of the Albine Place and Rubis Law Conservation Area, placing the proposal at odds with the aims of policy D4 uh, relating to the historic environment. It's worth noting uh, the point I made earlier about that area to the frontage having now been subject to a certificate of lawful existing use. Um, so previously the appointed officer's assessment was based on that having been unauthorised work and you know looking to secure the best possible outcome we're now in a position where the LRB is looking at that as an authorised situation so what's proposed may be seen as being a betterment in relative terms. <clears throat> in terms of the appellant's case uh, this was set in the notice of review along with a statement accompanying appendices um, We've already covered the, the letters of support from, from board members, so I won't, won't visit that. Uh, the following central points were made in the supporting statement. Uh, firstly, uh, just reiterating that the hard standing to the front was is now authorised and is therefore no longer a valid reason for refusal. Noted that the appointed officer's report didn't take issue with the replacement garage. Uh, noted that the proposal did not represent overdevelopment of the site in, in his report and concluded that the residential amenity of neighbouring properties would not be jeopardised. So really just drawing attention to the areas of the proposal that the appointed officer was satisfied with. Uh, noted the lack of objection from any neighbours or statutory consultees and uh, drew attention to support from local members. <clears throat> Contended that the proposal complies with policy H1 of the local development plan and the council's supplementary guidance. Um, relating to extensions, contends that the manner in which the rear extension wraps around the corner of the historic rear offshoot is in keeping with other end terrace properties in the street and in the surrounding area. Uh, notes also that the conservation area character appraisal and management plan for this area does not identify detached outbuildings as making a significant contribution to the character of the conservation area, but this proposal would facilitate positive change in the historic environment by giving up and uh, giving a new use to those. So if I just flick back, uh, what that's referring to is the outbuilding here that I mentioned before. So it seems that there was some concern from the appointed officer in their report that what had historically been an outbuilding was now being incorporated into the fabric of the of the main house. Um, uh, lastly, in terms of uh, the sporting statement, uh, the appellants also noted that the proposal would utilise materials that are appropriate to the building and its setting, resulting in a high quality contemporary extension 
that enhances the conservation area and complies with the development plan. <clears throat> Uh, in terms of consultations, the Council's Roads Development Management team noted that there would be an adequate level of car parking provided, uh, but the applicant had not demonstrated that proposed car parking facilities meet the minimum technical parking standards, so really just referring to the minimum dimensions. Uh, the applicants have, in the review submissions, added those dimensions to the plan, and I, I wouldn't consider that represents uh, a sort of material new addition to the plan because the proposal remains unchanged it's just adding the adding the dimension um, the local queen's cross and harlaw community council provided no response in relation to the proposal and there were no representations made in relation to this application um, at that point convener um, i'll just hand back over to you in terms of uh, what procedure may be necessary from here thank you um <laughs> Councillor McDonald, do you feel you have sufficient information to be able to make a determination today? Can I ask, convener, if the applicant has um, ha have made any representation about uh, about a site visit or not? Uh, um, before I yeah. you. Mr. Evans, I think did already allude to that. Do you want to just repeat, Mr. Evans? Uh, yes, that's right. Um, the applicant has expressed a view that they think a site visit would be beneficial so uh, that's that's what they'd be looking for okay i i must miss that um i i would um i think would like a site visit um i am quite i know that area quite well um but because it's of its end terrace um aspect i think i think it would be useful to go and and have a look at that um site would be my view um, Councillor Henderson. Uh, I personally would be happy to go ahead without a site visit, but um, I'll leave that to to you. I was just wondering um, at the moment with the current situation whether we would actually be able to carry out a site visit in a sort of timely manner. Um, I mean, obviously there is the, the the considerations to be given to the COVID and what what policies we we have had this discussion about what we can put in place if that we felt that we required a site visit. Um, I appreciate uh, Councillor McDonald's comments. I, I, however, I am I I feel that I am reasonably well aware of this the, the location. I understand it. You know, it's coming on to a, a lane at the side, and I think there's always the a better understanding sometimes of of the magnitude when you can see it on the ground. Um, I suppose that the pictures for me have been sufficient, but perhaps uh, Mrs. Christie, can you maybe give us um, or, or Mr. Evans in terms of a site visit? Because we did discuss um, the the because timelines are not quite the same during COVID. We don't have the same pressures. However, Mr. Evans, Ms. Christy, would you like to offer anything up? Um, yes, it would just be if you were thinking about a site visit, um, just really to um, think about whether it's absolutely essential, you know, given the current climate. Um, if you do think it is, you know, essential, you do need to see the um, site co um, convener. Um, planning would probably have to have done a, a risk assessment on how it could really be done safely. And um, there would be practical things to think about. So, for example, members would arrive, you know, in separate vehicles and we would all have to keep our um, distance from each other just in the, you know, um, as in relation to government gu guidelines. So um, it could be done, but it would have to be done safely and um, maybe need to think about whether you think it would be essential to um, go along. Okay. Mr. Evans, would you like to add anything? Um, nothing, nothing big to add, really. I, th I think I was just going to mention, you know, need to arrive separately and uh, maintain social distancing while we're while we're on site because it's, um, you know, dog legged by a rear lane. Perhaps it's it's a little bit easier than it might otherwise be, um, to get a feeling for the the effect of the extension to the rear. So, it could be that members felt comfortable carrying out that site visit without entering the premises um, which would you know arguably make things a lot more a lot more straightforward if, if we could do that just from the lane and um, if you considered it to be necessary so just something to bear in mind yeah 
Um, Councillor McDonald, can I come back to you? Just to obviously you've heard that. Would Good Street View, um, which I, I think Mr Evans, you may be able to bring up, I understand that sometimes it's being in the actual location that gives you the, the kind of the scale. Um, I mean, and, you know, I, I'm always um, willing to accept people's views in terms of site views. Um, does it just say, Mr. Evans, do you, do, would you like to see some Google views? I mean, if it's helpful, convener, um, it, 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 you know, listening to, to, to the arguments and, and particularly the essential, I'm not totally sold on, on going to the site visit and perhaps, um, you know, uh, you know, on the basis it, it was, it was just in, in normal circumstances. I, I would, I, I would like to have gone, but um, it's, it's not the be end and end all um, of, of making a, a decision. There has already been a, a lot in front of us, and um, with questions that, that there might be sufficient. But um, it might be useful. I'm, I'm finding it difficult because my iPad is not up and running to go to Google. And if you were able to. Um, just give me a little comfort, um, Mr. Evans, um, in having a look at, at at it from 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 um, from that point of view. I think that would be sufficient in this case. Just just to also add, sorry, uh, convener. Um, just to also add that there's no time limit time limit in con uh, considering the LRB uh, reviews. So, I mean, we could potentially be saying, well, let's have it in October, um, if if need be. So it's just to, to add that to the mix. Thank you very much, Mr. Masson. And Mr. Evans, could you give Councillor McDonald some help here? Of course, yeah. Um, what I'll do is, it's occurred to me that um, we have those visualisations that I mentioned before. Okay. Uh, I put them in the slides at the end of the presentation when I thought we might be treating them as new new information, but um, I'll, I'll get those up for you while I get Google queued up. And okay, maybe thank you very much. Some help. Uh, So, uh, yeah, the first image here um, is just sort of showing the, the massing as existing on the top image in blue and as proposed in the bottom image in red. Um, so you can see the, the general scale of the, the extensions and garages within the plot and um, these two garages being removed, of course, and um, new replacement garage onto the rear lane. And this is the extension and you can see how the, uh, the carport would work underneath with balcony above and uh, you can't quite see terribly well how it all links together in behind here, but uh, we also have these images here and just sort of coloured up renders. So that maybe gives you a better indication of the materials in terms of that hexagonal uh, slate cladding, which is obviously a, a more contemporary approach, more contemporary material relative to the granite building. And that's the view just walking down the side lane. So if you just bear with me a second, I do have um, Google open. Just while Gavin's uh, looking into that, it's just um, in terms of the process members have to be crystal clear in terms of whether they've got enough information before them and um, so i mean think saying things like um, we can't um, maybe consider this because of the the, the time obviously and um, the covid uh, situation and um, i think members should be thinking well um if we've got time to do that and wait for things to improve then then we can do that so so members just uh, be aware that uh, maybe that's not a particular reason for um, not having a site visit at this, obviously at this time, but uh, we can't have it later. I don't, I'm maybe not making myself clear there, but you, yeah. members just have to be clear that they've got the information before them. That's what I'm just trying to say before they make a decision. Thanks. Absolutely, Mr. Masson. I think once we've seen these photographs and any street view that Mr. Evans can provide us, I will um, go over with the members again if they feel they do have now sufficient overview of the site to be able to make a determination. Thank you. Thank you. So this will be the moment where we discover whether the Google car went down the lane or not, which would be <laughs> very helpful if it did. Uh, I think we seem to be okay. 
So there we have the, the two existing garage doors, both of which would be removed. Um, we'd have railings along this, uh, this section just to the side of the side of the uh, door to the upper flat. And then uh, new gates formed in to the undercroft to the, uh, the carport area. Probably best to go down to the bottom and then turn. I'm glad you're working this, Mr. Evans, and not me. <laughs> <laughs> Expert hands. Yeah. Um, so you can see that the, the garage buildings themselves are of, of little sort of architectural merit, just being sort of profiled sheeting, um, sort of low rise, flat roof sort of things. Um, these are the more sort of traditional, robustly built sort of granite outhouses. And there's a the little sort of uh, detailed corner one, which is slightly larger there. I was worried that might happen. <laughs> there we go. That's a bit better. Yeah. Is that helpful for you, Councillor McDonald? Is there any particular viewpoint you'd like, uh, Mr. Evans? No, that's exceptionally um, helpful. Um, I think just, I mean, I do, I do know the area um, very well, but I think just having not been out and about um, uh, recently, I think, I think um, that's been exceptionally helpful. And I certainly have a much more, I'm much clearer in my own mind about, um, you know, the, the wider aspect of the development and, and, and so on. So, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you, Professor Evans. Um, Mr. Uh, Councillor Hendrickson, is that be helpful to yourself? Uh, yeah, that's fine with me. Um, I've actually looked at that um, previously, so I was aware of what we were looking at. Super. Okay, so can I then ask, are we content to, to go on to determine the application today then? Councilor Without McDonald? further information, yes, I'm happy to proceed. Yeah, okay. I'm happy to go forward. And I am as well. So Mr Evans, if I could now maybe ask you to um, talk us through the, the relevant policies. Sure. Uh, let's get my presentation. Sorry, just then before Gavin starts, uh, Councillor Henderson, you've uh, raised your hand um, and, uh, in terms of, it's just, a, just a, to remind you to take it back down again. <laughs> I didn't know how to do it, Mark. I was thinking it was maybe myself and I kept pressing the screen thinking nothing's happening. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, so in terms of uh, relevant policies from a local development plan, uh, the application's in a residential area and it's zoned accordingly uh, under policy H1. Uh, this sets out a number of tests for new development to satisfy, um, stating that proposals for new development will be acceptable in principle, provided that they firstly do not constitute overdevelopment, secondly do not have an unacceptable impact on the character and amenity of the surrounding area. And that's the one really where there's judgment to be exercised in terms of what you think that, uh, that character or amenity is and how you feel that this proposal would would affect it, whether positively or negatively. Um, thirdly, a uh, proposal should not result in the loss of valuable or valued areas of open space. Uh, this is referring to public open space and because we're looking at a, a residential cartilage, uh, there would be no effect there. Um, and lastly, proposals should comply with relevant supplementary guidance. Uh, in this case, the relevant supplementary guidance is the Householder Development Guide, as well as the Council's guidance on windows and doors. Um, moving on, uh, policy D1 uh, is a sort of universal policy applying to, to all developments and um, requiring that developments are of a high standard of design which demonstrates an understanding of its context um, and um, linking to the six essential qualities of good placemaking just listed there. Uh, again, because we're within a single residential cartilage, um, you know, some of those will be more relevant than others. <clears throat> um, policy D4 relates to the historic environment, most notably listed buildings and conservation areas. Uh, this property is not listed, but it is located within the Albine Place and Rubus Law uh, conservation area. 
And so policy D4 states that the City Council will protect, preserve and enhance the historic environment in line with national and local policy and guidance and also offers support for high quality design which respects the character, appearance and setting of our historic environment and protects the special architectural and historic interest of listed buildings and conservation areas. So again, a matter of judgment there in terms of how you feel this proposal would interact with its historic surroundings and to what extent it would, uh, would, it would harm or enhance the character uh, and appearance of the conservation area. So on to supplementary guidance. Uh, as I mentioned, the householder supplementary guidance is, is central. Um, this sets out a series of general principles for uh, extensions. Uh, firstly, that those should be architecturally compatible in design and scale with the original house and surrounding area. And um, just on that point, I would highlight that compatible doesn't necessarily mean uh, entirely matching in materials. You know, members could consider that something is compatible whilst being contemporary, but uh, it's, it's a matter of judgment again. Uh, extensions should not dominate or overwhelm an original house and should remain visually subservient. Uh, in this case, on the street view image, we saw that the, the existing sort of um, lean to style extension is, is just on a single story off the rear protrusion. So what's proposed would introduce uh, a two story extension there. It's a question of how, how subservient you consider that would be. Uh, no extension should result in a situation where amenity or neighbouring properties would be adversely affected in terms of privacy, daylight and general amenity. In the officer's report, um, that wasn't an issue of any particular concern. Uh, earlier developments approved before this guidance was introduced will not be accepted as justification in support of proposals that otherwise fail to comply with these criteria. And the footprint of a dwelling as extended should not exceed twice that of the original house. And that wouldn't apply in this case because the, uh, the footprint of the original property is, is quite significant and the extension comes, uh, comes nowhere close to doubling that. Uh, no more than 50% of the front or rear cartilage may be covered by development. Um, in terms of the front cartilage, we saw before that there would be an improvement um, through the reconfiguration of um, that garden and reintroduction of soft landscaping um, in place of what's currently just uh, exclusively hard standing. Uh, and the size and ex the size of extension, excuse me, permissible and detached properties will be determined on a case by case basis. Uh, moving on also to the relevant supplementary guidance on windows, uh, the repair and um, sorry, it's, it's Repair and repairing and retaining, excuse me, historic windows will always be promoted over the replacement of windows. Uh, Non-traditional windows should always be restored to a traditional style appropriate to the age and character of the building. Um, as we heard before, the, the upper level windows um, are currently UPVC, so seem to have been altered in a, a less sympathetic way at some point in the past, and the applicant's proposing to <clears throat> replace those with timber sashing case frames that um, are of the type normally sought for a property of this style. Uh, if non-historic windows on the public elevation within a conservation area are to be replaced, the reinstatement of original types and arrangements of windows will always be encouraged. Uh, and where existing UPVC sashing case windows are to be replaced, replacement with UPVC sashing case may be permitted subject to criteria. Um, so in that sense, there is there is a clear betterment in terms of what's going and what's being introduced. Uh, Scottish planning policy also of relevance in terms of its commentary on um, proposals within conservation areas uh, being required to preserve or enhance the character and appearance of the conservation area. Proposals that do not harm the character or appearance should be treated as preserving it. Um, Historic Environment Scotland's uh, Managing Change publications are also of some relevance. Um, there's one in relation to extensions and one in relation to windows. And these are, these are also material considerations out with the development plan. So in relation to extensions, there's a few criteria here. Firstly, proposals must protect the character and appearance of the building, should be subordinate in scale and form, should be located on a secondary elevation, 
must be designed in a high quality manner using appropriate materials and extensions that would unbalance a symmetrical elevation and threaten the original design concept should be avoided. In terms of windows, um, this is largely consistent with the Council's own guidance. Um, maintenance and repair is always preferred. Uh, where a window is beyond repair, its replacement should be permitted. Uh, in this case, we're obviously talking about replacing a non-traditional UPVC window, so less relevant there. Um, talks about circumstances for replacing sash windows, uh, that's, that's not relevant. And in other cases, windows may be modern replacements, sometimes inexact copies of original examples or using inappropriate sections or materials. Um, and in those circumstances, it should be acceptable to replace windows with an aim to regain the original design intention or improve the existing situation. So I think in, in this sense, there is, um, there is a degree of improving the existing situation. Uh, so um, just points to consider. Firstly, does the proposal satisfy the test set out by policy H1? Um, would it have an unacceptable impact on the character and amenity of the area? Does it comply with the relevant supplementary guidance contained in the Householder Development Guide? And in design terms, is the proposal of sufficient design quality to meet the requirements of policy D1? Um, you also have the, the other material considerations provided by Historic Environment Scotland's publications which gives sort of best practice guidance. Um, again, happy to happy to assist with conditions if members are minded to approve. And I'll just hand over to you there, Kimberly. Thank you very much, Mr. Evans. Um, I'll go, Councillor Hendrickson, have you got questions for Mr. Evans? Yes, I have. I, I seem to remember reading through the papers that if the, let's see if I can explain this, the, the extension out the back had fallen within the um, gable end of, of, of the existing bit that, that, that sticks out, that would have been more acceptable. Is the problem the fact that it actually wraps around um, the building? Um, is that the main issue? That certainly seems to seems to be one of the main concerns coming through from the officer's report, yes. Uh, I think the, the original plan form of a building is generally quite important in historic um, environments. So what you're looking to do is try and retain some sense of what is the original plan form and what and to ensure that any new addition is sort of readily distinguishable, if you see what I mean. So adding something that wraps around or envelops or conceals an entire elevation is generally something that's um, less desirable. And um, so that seems to have been a central point for the officer. Yeah, I've got a follow on question from that convener. So the, the I'm, I'm trying to phrase this. So the fact that the, the wraparound bit wouldn't actually be visible looking at the plans from um, almost um, any uh, viewpoint, um, is that sort of something that we would take into account? Because looking at the plans, it doesn't appear, and from the ground views that we've been given, it doesn't look as if that wraparound is particularly visible from almost um, any point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, the position of that, um, I think it's fair to say, means that it wouldn't be as readily visible as it might otherwise be. Um, so that is relevant in terms of your assessment of how visually intrusive it might be. In terms of the sort of conservation merits, that's less concerned, I would say, about whether something is visible or not, because there's a sort of conservation integrity of the building um, and that sort of thing. But so it's, I know that's a slightly contradictory answer, but I suppose what I'm saying is it is relevant, but it's not the only factor. So, you know, the conservation side of it would, would really look to retain that plan form as much as possible. Uh, Councillor MacDonald. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, convener. Um, I, I had a sort of similar um, question as Councillor Hendrickson. Um, so, but I'll go on to, to the, the railings that um, are proposed um, and having seen the, the Google, there's there's nothing there at the moment, but there seem to be railings and hedging um, that was um, proposed for that area. Would, would that be correct? Yes, that's right. Just along the uh, the elevation to the lane, 
it's not presently enclosed. It's uh, it's just quite open, but it but it is within the cartilage of uh, of this building. Okay, thanks. Um, and the um, what's my other questions? Well, perhaps you could go on, convener, and I'll find just okay. one other one. Uh, Mr. Evans, could I just ask you, in terms of, um, you, you mentioned obviously the gates are going to create a wider opening. How much of the rubble wall would be additional would be lost? Um, I'll just have a quick look at the elevation. <clears throat> mm. From the looks of it, it doesn't appear that there's a significant amount of the wall that would be lost because um, the gates are really going in and um, it may help if I share my screen at this point actually rather than trying to badly describe something. <clears throat> Everyone see that okay? Yeah, thank you. So um, what I was getting at is that <clears throat> where the gates are being introduced is really at the point where you have the existing garage that's to be removed. Um, so it's sort of a cleared area where the, the boundary wall isn't present at the moment. So um, it seems like there would be relatively minimal alteration to the wall itself. Super. Can I check as well the pitch of the roof? Because one of the pic uh, pictures looked almost like it was a flat roof. Can I just ask, is it not a flat roof? Is it a new garage? On the new garage? Yeah, it's a uh, pitched yeah, that's roof. Yeah, that's a pitched ridged roof, yeah. Okay. Fine. Um, let me just check and see if I had any other questions. Uh, no, I think that was all of my questions. Councillor McDonald, have you found any other questions? I did actually. It was a question around um, those outbuildings, um, um, and I didn't quite um, understand um, th those outbuildings seem to be all linked together and just have one door going in at the end now whereas before there would have been separate doors presumably for um maybe separate owners um on on them and i just wondered um what's what significance of of, of that is I, I just couldn't really work out what was going on um i think the intention would just be to to retain the outer shell of those um, of those sheds, but then to <clears throat> to downtake the internal walls, possibly just to make it a more usable space, and um, you know a, a single sort of larger shed rather than um, these smaller individual ones. Um, but it looks like the the plan has them still retaining the doors, so you would still have in sort of conservation terms the you know the outward appearance. You're retaining a lot of the fabric, so I think that's the plan anyway. Okay. Because it's certainly the case in many other properties around town that they, those outhouses are then incorporated into um, a usable part of the indoor building. Yes, that's true. Um, although that can quite often result in a sort of, you know, long, narrow sort of galley style kitchen sort of thing. Um, I think given the scale of the extension, perhaps um, <clears throat> the applicants just didn't didn't see that as providing a sort of viable footprint for for some part of the internal space but just speculating really. thank you any further questions councillor mcdonald no that's fine thank you convener councillor hendrickson no i'm fine i think okay um obviously we now need to determine the application since i made the uh, councillor mcdonald go first last time i'll go first this time and then councillor hendrickson be prepared your first next time <laughs> um you know, again, it's quite a complex application because we are dealing in, in a conservation area um, and, you know, we've got some beautiful granite architecture and houses. However, um, I think for me, it's always making sure that these houses remain viable and usable for today's families. Because it was obviously, I think probably when it was built, it was one house. Um, and as we know now, it's not one house. It, it's home to several people. Um, I must admit, originally I was a little bit concerned until Mr Evans showed us that those um, coloured up pictures 
um, about how the, the, the slate would blend into to the, to the existing house, um, particularly given it was covering a significant part of the, the extension. Um, you know, we, we have to obviously look at the different policies um, and each one, um, you know, clearly I don't think it's overdevelopment and neither did the officer. Um, does it have a detrimental impact in the conservation area? Again, I would suggest it wouldn't. If you look next door is um, Blenheim House, if you look to the rear of it, there's several large car parks. And in fact, actually, I think the proposed development allows for a number of improvements, um, such as replacement of PVC windows with uh, traditional um, sashin case um, timber windows. We're gonna get some railings back, many of which were removed, obviously, in the, the, the war aid. Uh, coming back into use and I think they always add an attractive element in the conservation area. Obviously I think we'd need a condition to make sure they were appropriate and not of a, an inappropriate design. I think the fact that we're actually getting the front garden back into you know semi-use um, with, with a soft landscaped area rather than just the hard standing I think again actually will improve the, the conservation area. Uh, I, I think the, the existing garage um, and the or garages um, actually are quite of an, eye, an eyesore, to be perfectly honest. I think the integrity of the main building and the side elevation um, to the point of the main part of the house actually is, is kept in, in, keeps its integrity. And I think that actually, given that we're not stepping out with the, the actual line and there seems to be a step in from the, the main um, dwelling um, line, I think is pretty helpful. Yes, it does then wrap around a little bit further than perhaps is, is perfect. But again, a lot of these arguments are around balance. Um, you know, we're making a, a, a house that's fit for purpose. We're reusing a granite house. I think that, you know, if we look at some of the historic, um, then, or not historic, Extension, sorry, extensions to historic buildings in the past and, and even more recently, they've been quite dramatic in nature to show the differentiation of, of what was and what is an extension um, to that house. So, you know, I, I think actually this is reasonably subtle in comparison to some of the other ones. I think the fact that we haven't had any objection from um, the, the community council, which are who are normally quite uh, forward and making representations if they think there's a detrimental impact to the conservation area. You know, the, the, as I say, I, th I think this is an on, again another on balance argument, but I think given the, the positives that we will get from this application in terms of the replacement of, of windows, the, the, re the renewal of a, an area which was all hard landscape to land, soft landscaping, the railings, um, and, and I think it's considered, I don't think it's it's a huge development. And I think the fact they're keeping the, um, the lean-tos, whatever you call them, sheds, um, and whether they use them internally for something slightly different, <coughs> excuse me, they are retaining them. Um, I think in the round, the development actually is acceptable for myself. Um, and, you know, design quality, excuse me till I take a drink of water and my mouth's going. <clears throat> Sorry, in terms of design quality, I actually think it, 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 it's quite sympathetic and I think it you know, will blend in quite nicely. So I haven't got a problem with the design. I think it does comply in general terms with the, on the supplemental guidance on, on, on windows. So for me, you know, I would actually move to overturn uh, the officer's recommendations but with conditions which I'd ask Mr Evans to give consideration to um, Councillor Hendrickson. Thank you, Kavina. Um, I think I agree with everything that you've said. I mean, interesting in the report. Sorry, I'm looking at the plan over to one okay. um, the, the main concern to me um, from the officer was the fact that the, the extension didn't actually um, fit within the existing gable end of the building. Um, and he was concerned about the wraparound. But having looked at the, 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 the pictures, particularly the new ones today, uh, I'm not sure that the wraparound, um, although not ideal, um, actually will, will um, have a, a major impact on 
the, the look of the building. Uh, my only concern, and I think I read this in the report, was um, the fact that some of the materials hadn't been put forward. Um, so there was a little bit of doubt as to the quality of the materials. But if there was a condition put in to make sure that those were up to standard, um, I, I, I would go with um, the, the, the convener on this one. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Hendrickson. Councillor MacDonald. Um, there were certain elements that uh, I, I did like about the application. Um, I certainly thought the improvement of the garden at the front, and um, I'd be interested you know, um, you know th that's that improvement. The, the windows I did think were an improvement. Um, uh, in terms of representation, whilst the community council didn't um, come in and and say anything about it, they didn't come in to support it either. So on balance, I, I haven't really taken that into my consideration. But um, although it's not a huge uh, development, um, I, I just think it is it is not a appropriate. If I'm honest, um, you know. From, from my point of view, I think it is quite visually intrusive um, and under H1, um, I, I would be upholding the um, officer's recommendation to refuse. Um, I do think there are ele elements of the design that I, I, I did like, but I think, um, and, I, and I get the point about juxtapositioning old and, and new and so on, but I wasn't comforted by, um, by the design uh, either. So, um, uh, on this occasion, I would be um, I would be going with with um, re refusal. Um, um, Mr. Masson, obviously, we just for completeness, obviously, myself and Councillor um, Dixon are minded to um, overturn the officer's recommendation. But I ask Mr. Evans. I mean, I agree with Councillor Hendrickson in terms of conditions for the materials, which is quite a standard one that we've got on. But is there other conditions along with that one that you would uh, be able to recommend? Uh, yes, um, material samples, as you mentioned, um, Councillor Hendrickson, is one that we would recommend uh, be agreed prior to work commencing. Um, in addition to that, uh, details of the new railings uh, to ensure compliance with the technical advice on those. And I think the officer made reference to there being a sort of lack of specification. Um, also, a specification to the uh, the gate to the side, just to show the the means of making good in the boundary wall. Um, where there is some some uh, intervention there um, and also a construction method statement regarding works to the boundary wall um, a requirement for the car parking to be installed uh, per the per the plans just to ensure that the, the development has sufficient parking available um, and also that the windows be installed per the submitted specifications um, I didn't have them up on the presentation today, but there are sort of cross sections showing the spec of the sash and case windows. So, um, um, but but that was that was all the things that that came to mind. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Evans. Councillor Hendrickson, you satisfied with the conditions that we're going to attach? Yes, I am. Yes, I'm. Okay, thank you, Mr. Masson. If you you maybe because there's a a division, I think it might be helpful just to ask us all to to, to vote just to make sure we've got it clear for the the record. Okay, thank you, uh, Chairperson. Um, so we obviously have the application before us, and um, the officers um, have decided that it be refused. But I'll go to a vote and to determine what the local review body um, have decided. Councillor Bolton. Uh, to overturn the officer's recommendation to approve the application with a number of conditions as identified by Mr. Evans. Councillor um, Henriksen. Uh, to overturn the uh, officer's recommendations um, and implement the conditions. And thank you. And Councillor MacDonald. To uphold the um, officer's recommendation and uh, therefore to refuse the application. OK, that's um, a majority of two to one to overturn the officer's recommendations and to approve the application with conditions. Thank you very much, folks. Right now, if we could just turn to the consideration of the third review in respect of the decision to refuse the application for the erection of a coffee, sh coffee shop with drive through and associated infrastructure and landscaping works at site two in Town Road, Broadford Road. Planning reference 191277 DPP. We'll again hear from the planning advisor, Mr. Gavin Evans, who will provide us with a brief description of the application proposal and a reminder of the reason why the application was refused. I would again point out that Mr. Evan attends today's meeting to provide us with the necessary 
professional type planning guidance because he has not been involved in the earlier consideration of the application under review. Mr Evans will not, however, be asked to express any view in the merits of the proposed development and, in effect, his role will be a neutral one involving the provision of factual information and guidance only. For to yourself, Mr Evans. Thank you, convener. Presentation up here. Okay. Everyone see that okay? Yes, thank you. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you, Convener. So uh, with this third case, we have a request for review against an application refused under delegated powers for detailed planning permission for the direction of a coffee shop with drive through and associated infrastructure and landscaping uh, at site two in town road, Broadfold Road. Uh, again, the review was found to have been submitted with all the necessary information and within the time limit of three months following the decision taken by the appointed officer. Uh, no new matters have been raised in relation to this review and no further procedure has been requested from the applicant. Uh, they've expressed a view that um, they're satisfied that we proceed on the basis of these written submissions. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, in terms of site description, uh, the application site lies to the northern side of Broadfold Road, uh, Bridge of Dawn, and is bounded on its eastern and northern sides by Intown Road, just here. Uh, the busy A956 Ellen Road lies approximately 30 metres to the east, just here, um, to the other side of a belt of trees uh, and runs parallel to Intown Road. So uh, there's a sort of landscape tree belt, which uh, you maybe see on the, I think it have an aerial shot. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, so that perhaps shows it best. Slightly out of date image because um, there has been work going on on this site since the time of that photo. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the site extends to uh, 0 0.28 hectares uh, or 2,800 square metres um, and previously formed part of a, a wider site. Um, you see the way in which it's shown here, the, the red line is the application site and the blue line is land, which is also in the applicant's control. <coughs> so previously, the entirety of this area formed one single site, which was the premises of a car sales garage, um, which also had a repair and servicing workshop prior to that site being cleared and separated into two units of roughly equal size. Um, the other site has now been developed as a hot food restaurant and drive through um, come to that uh, in more detail shortly, but uh, it's, it's not currently in operation. Um, to the west of the site is a neighbouring industrial building and associated yard area, whilst to the north on the other side of Intown Road is the BOC gas depot. It's just over here. So yeah, you can see that a bit more clearly from the aerial shot. Um, the site lies within an area zoned in the local development plan for principally business and industrial uses, where policy <laughs> will apply, um, similar to the, the first case we considered today. Uh, in terms of application history, uh, the appointed officer's report highlights relevant planning history, both uh, on the entirety of the former car garage premises and on the other adjoining half form through subdivision of that larger plot. Um, in terms of the whole former, cap, former car garage site, which is this whole footprint there, um, in 2012, uh, the redevelopment of the site, including demolition of the car showroom and workshop uh, with an industrial commercial unit, car park and yard was approved conditionally in 2015. Um, uh, in 2015, uh, there was also an application for temporary consent for a 76 bedroom containerized hotel with social space and car parking uh, and change of use to hotel. Uh, that application was withdrawn before determination in November of 2015. And um, in the adjoining half of the subdivided site, so uh, that's referring to, to the blue portion here, uh, the erection of a fast food restaurant with associated drive through uh, was refused under delegated powers in December of 2016. Uh, that application was referred to the local review body in February of 2017, where the proposal was again refused. Um, though the LRB accepted the principle of the change of use, um, it was refused on transport impact grounds. Um, in 2017, a subsequent application for the erection of a fast food restaurant with associated drive-through 
uh, was approved under delegated powers uh, in November of 2017, um, with uh, officers satisfied that the, the transport issues had been over, overcome at that time. Uh, so this is just a street view image from Broadfold Road. So uh, this is the other adjoining half of the site. Our application site is actually just off, uh, off towards that side of the image. And that's the existing site plan. So the application seeks detailed planning permission for the erection of a coffee shop with drive through facility, uh, as well as associated areas of car parking and landscaping. So there's the proposed site plan there. The site would be accessed from the southeastern corner, just here, uh, off In Town Road, with the proposed single storey building located towards the northern boundary. Uh, vehicles are directed in a one way system coming in and being. Sorry about that. Just a notification popping up on my screen. Um, yeah, so vehicles directed in a one way system. Uh, drive through customers would be directed to a dedicated drive through lane uh, towards the, the rear of the site, uh, running clockwise along the west and northern boundaries before returning to the site access. So it just comes around the back of the property and you have a uh, drive through service window here. Uh, waiting bays, uh, a couple of those just there, and then returns back to the access. <clears throat> uh, 22 car parking spaces are shown on the proposed site plan, including three accessible spaces. Uh, the single storey building would be located towards the northern end of the site, and uh, that's just a, a zoomed in view of the site plan. Um, I'll come back to the landscaping plan shortly. Um, what I'll do quickly is to show you the elevations. Um, so the uh, the building would feature a mono pitch roof and would be finished in a combination of full height glazing and vertical timber cladding with black panel cladding also utilized on secondary elevations. So this is the elevation facing into the car park, which is a sort of main point for arrival for, for people who are coming from their cars to, to dine in, as it were. Um, so this is the black cladding on the sort of secondary elevations. Um, main public elevation faces south onto the car park with a brick clad fin feature protruding from the roof, um, bearing high level signage, uh, which may require separate authorization as with the, the other case we considered. So you can see that just there. Uh, that reaches an overall height of 7.3 meters. Um, an external refuse store, uh, if I flick back to this plan. External refuse store um, is located adjacent to the western elevation to be contained within a timber enclosure using vertical cladding to match the front of the building. So you might, I think you can see that in the elevations as well. Yeah, there we go. So that's the that's the timber enclosure for the for the bins and things there. Uh, Landscaping is also shown to the edges of the site. There we go. Uh, Landscaping plan demonstrates a combination of grass, shrub, planting and specimen tree planting with a total of 12 trees shown around the, uh, around the site boundaries. Uh, in terms of the uh, appointed officers uh, reasons for refusal, sorry I'll, uh, I'll come come through these, sorry my script doesn't necessarily match the, uh, match the slides. So this is the rear elevation as we're looking at the, uh, the building from the drive through lane. So again that's the uh, contained refuse store. Um, the black cladding continues along this elevation because it's essentially the rear of the rear of the building, really not going to be not going to be much seen. Um, and then the uh, the drive-through window just enclosed in the same timber cladding as the frontage. Uh, this is two side views. Uh, it's the same side view, just showing the the enclosure, and then you know without the enclosure, so you can see the elevation in the main building behind. And that's that's the, the roof plan and you see the external enclosure there. Um, sections through, again just showing the scale, uh, fairly modest height, just a single storey building with a relatively shallow pitched roof. Uh, so turning to the appointed officer's reasons for refusal, um, the appointed officers uh, pointed to a conflict with policy B1 on the basis that the proposal would not be ancillary to the business and industrial use of the surrounding area and would serve a wider catchment, including passing vehicle traffic on the Ellen Road. 
Uh, no evidence was provided to demonstrate compliance with policies NC4 and NC5 relating to the location of significant footfall generation. <coughs> so again, as with the first case we considered, um, the question here for members is whether you consider that this proposal is a significant footfall generating development. The officers in this case have come to the conclusion that it, that it would be. Um, uh, recognises that the site is accessible by sustainable means uh, in relation to policy T3 of the local development plan and satisfies other policies uh, D1, R6 and NE6 on technical matters. Uh, notes, however, that problems with traffic flow issues around the Ellen Road and Broadfold Road Junction and the Broadfold Road in Town Road Junction persist in spite of junction upgrades and the introduction of waiting restrictions and before the consented drive through next door has actually begun operating. Um, so there were some improvements carried out. Uh, if I go back to the location plan, there were some improvements carried out to the in town road junction um, in order to try and alleviate uh, the, the traffic concerns and to allow for this development to go ahead. Um, there's a difference of opinion in terms of how successful those have been and they may have been successful in addressing the problem that there was but inadvertently created a different problem I think seems to be the um, the theme <coughs> excuse me uh, so as a result of that issue um, officers came to the view that there would be a conflict with policy t2 in terms of the appellant's case, uh, the appellant submitted a, a statement in support of this, uh, this review. Uh, the following key points highlighted. Uh, recognises that the proposal does not strictly comply with policy B1, however contends that it would serve a function ancillary to the business and industrial area and other material considerations outweigh uh, policy B1 in that context points to a substantial amount of vacant space within the surrounding business and industrial area and the slow take up of that space, suggesting that there's limited demand and that alternative uses should be sought. It uh, highlights a significant employment land supply across the city, um, points to the visual benefit in removing this gap site and utilising brownfield land for development, points to the creation of employment opportunities and economic benefit and argues that the site is too small to be viable for business or industrial use. Uh, highlights also that the site has, uh, in one form or another, been marketed since 2012 with no interest for business use. When I say in one form or another, I'm meaning that the initial marketing was on the basis of the building or the site and in its entirety, whereas more recent efforts will have related to, uh, to the individual two plots separately. <clears throat> Um, the submissions uh, provided as part of the application were seen to demonstrate the local road network had been improved to accommodate this development and the council's roads team accepted that position. Um, the use was seen as supporting existing businesses and enhancing the appeal of the remaining vacant business land um, and contends that the use is not a destination in itself and would operate more like a local convenience facility. So. That's really alluding to the, the catchment um, across which uh, visitors would be attracted. It points to similar approvals uh, on both the adjoining site and in other areas zoned uh, for B1, uh, zoned under policy B1, and contends that a review of alternative sites in relation to policies NC4 and NC5 is not required on the basis that this is not a significant footfall generating use. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, in terms of consultations, um, the Council's Roads Development Management team had no objection to the proposal. Uh, additional analysis of the development's impact on the operation of uh, the Broadfold Road and the In Town Road Junction was sought and provided, and uh, the Roads Development Management team was satisfied with the submission made. Earlier concerns regarding servicing and access arrangements were also addressed through agreement of a revised servicing strategy. Uh, it was recommended that submission of a travel plan and details of staff cycle parking be subject to conditions in the event the application was to be approved. Uh, there was no response from or no comments to make from the Council's environmental health team 
uh, no objection from the health and safety executive who were consulted on the basis of uh, hazardous substances nearby, I believe. Um, the local Bridge of Dawn Community Council objected to the proposal. Um, the full response, which I think is quite lengthy, is included in the agenda, but main points included uh, the exacerbation of existing traffic flow problems at the at the Broadfold Road, Ellen Road and Broadfold Road, Intown Road junctions, uh, related safety concerns arising from those traffic flow problems. Uh, noted that the works already undertaken in relation to the approved KFC on Intown Road have failed to address problems at these junctions without that unit ever having been brought into use. It's therefore assumed that the problem would be exacerbated when both that unit and potentially the one before the LRB are, are also in operation with the associated uh, traffic generated. Uh, highlighted that the desk-based assessment undertaken by roads officers does not reflect the real conditions observed at the junctions in question and highlights an inconsistency between the applicants insistence that many users would travel on foot or by other means of sustainable transport um, and that vehicle traffic would be low with the inclusion of a drive-through facility in the proposal. And lastly, warns that roads assessments have previously indicated that the McDonald's store on Broadfold Road would operate within junction capacity. However, problems with traffic flow were observed almost immediately on its, uh, its development. In terms of representation, uh, no representations were received from members of the public. And uh, at that point, Councillor Bolton, I would just hand back to you for members to decide on for the procedure. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Mr Evans. We obviously now need to determine whether we have sufficient information to be able to determine the application before us. <clears throat> Excuse me, can I just ask Councillor Hendrickson? Uh, yes, I can do that. Okay, Councillor MacDonald? Yes, I have enough information, thank you. Uh, equally, I feel I have sufficient information. Um, in front of me to be able to determine the application today. Mr Evans, would you like to go into the policies? Thank you. Apologies if you can hear a crying baby in the background. It's rather nice, actually, because it's, it's not sensitive my microphone. <laughs> I'll cheer up soon. Um, so, yes, uh, thank you, convener. Um, turning first to policy B1 relating to the zoning policy for business and industrial areas. Uh, again, this sets out that land zoned in this way should be retained for classes four, five and six, which is business, industrial and storage and distribution um, and safeguarded from other conflicting development types. Um, does allow for uh, other uses suitable to business or industrial areas such as car showrooms um, and will also allow for the expansion of existing businesses. Uh, facilities that directly support business industrial uh, uses may be permitted where they enhance the attraction and sustainability of the city's business industrial land, but facilities should be aimed at primarily meeting the needs of businesses and employees within those areas, uh, the implication being not across a much wider catchment or encouraging travel, uh, travel as a, as a destination. Um, policies NC4 and NC5. Uh, as we mentioned before, these relate to um, the location of significant footfall generating uses. So first and foremost, there's a question of whether members consider this proposed use to be something which generates significant footfall and is going to attract um, large numbers of visitors. In the officer's report, I believe it's mentioned that, uh, you know, the, the product sold is um, low cost, high volume, as it were. Um, so I think they were making the point that such uses typically attract a higher footfall because they need that level of trade in order to uh, in order to to sustain themselves. <clears throat> uh, so there is a general requirement to locate such footfall generating uses within existing designated centres. Uh, these are set out in supplementary guidance and policy NC5 um, sets out criteria that must be satisfied for uh, significant footfall generating uses where they're located in out of centre sites. Um, so if you consider that this is a significant footfall generating use, then, then these tests under NC5 um, will need to be looked into. 
Um, the officer's report highlights that no such evidence was provided in terms of the assessment of alternative sites or whether there were any available within existing designated centres. Uh, so there was no no commentary or, uh, or evidence provided on that basis. <clears throat> Policy D1 uh, relates to design quality, requires development to be of a high standard of design, which demonstrates an understanding of its context and links to the six qualities uh, essential to good placemaking. Um, other relevant policies include Policy T2, which uh, is the management of, impact, of transport impact. <coughs> Policy T3, encouraging sustainable and active travel. And Policy R6, which relates to waste management requirements for new development. Uh, in terms of supplementary guidance, the Council's Transport and Accessibility guidance is also relevant in terms of um, setting out car parking standards and the like. Uh, so, in summing up, um, oh sorry, other material considerations, the Strategic Development Plan um, provides a high level commentary on the importance of sustainable economic growth. Um, Scottish planning policy sets out a requirement to protect town centres with a town centre first approach for uses which attract a significant number of people. Scottish planning policy highlights that planning permission should not be granted for significant travel generating uses at locations which would increase reliance on the car and where sites are not appropriately accessible uh, by sustainable means. It's worth noting the appointed officer's report does acknowledge that the site is accessible to cyclists and pedestrians and also via public transport, but considers that by its nature a drive through with on site parking provision will encourage travel by private car, which would be lessened if located in an appropriate designated centre. So summing up the, the following sort of key points for, for discussion. Um, first and foremost, zoning. Do members consider the proposed uses permitted by the terms of policy B1, i.e. would this development enhance the attraction and sustainability of the city's business and industrial land? And secondly, would it cater principally for the needs of those businesses and employees or would it serve a much larger catchment? In terms of retail impact, do members consider the proposal represents a significant footfall generating development appropriate to a town centre? And if so, policies NC4 and NC5 will apply. Uh, and consequently, has the necessary supporting evidence been provided to demonstrate that the proposal uh, meets those criteria set out in NC4 and NC5? And lastly, design is a proposal of sufficient design quality. Um, in this context, uh, we're obviously in a sort of business and industrial setting where there is perhaps less sensitivity than might be the case in a conservation area or a more historic part of town, although um, arguably there's a degree of prominence to the site from a main approach into the city. So that might be a, a factor in your thinking also. So ultimately coming to a conclusion on whether you feel the proposal complies with the development plan as a whole, and if not, are there any material considerations that otherwise weigh in its favour? Again, happy to assist with conditions or any questions. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much, Mr. Evans. Um, can I take questions? Councillor McDonald first. Yeah, um, going back to the very beginning of your presentation, um, Mr. Evans, um, I, I just want to be clear in my own mind about the, the history of, of site and um, just to, to fully understand what were the um, transport issues that um, uh, that you that you you mentioned at, at the beginning? Um, uh, I think it was from the the, the 2017 application was uh, approved. You said because those issues had been addressed, but I I just wanted to be clear in my own mind what those transport issues were in the first place. Sure, um, it might help actually if I just get an aerial view up so I can maybe talk through this. Um, so if we can see that, okay. Um, so my understanding is that the the sort of basis for all of these problems is that traffic waiting to access the McDonald's on Broadfold Road um, frequently queues out onto Broadfold Road itself, and often even into uh, into the traffic on Ellen Road. Um, that can cause problems where people are trying to uh, move from east to west across Broadfold Road. So where there's stationary traffic sitting here, if traffic's trying to turn right and in, 
it has to go onto the wrong side of the road. Um, similarly, where traffic is waiting to turn right into the drive through, it may sit here and similarly halt traffic going uh, going west to east. Um, uh, I understand that the applicant uh, carried out some work that involved, I think, widening or localised widening along the frontage of their site in order to try and alleviate that and allow for vehicles to pass one another more readily and also introduced uh, parking restrictions uh, or, you know, arranged for a traffic regulation order in order that parking restrictions can be introduced. Um, but uh, from what I understand, um, the road widening has now just allowed for people to uh, place their orders at McDonald's and then park on the opposite side of the road using it as a sort of waiting area. So in some ways, it may be seen to have addressed one problem and sort of created another. Um, so um, the, the observation of the, uh, the officer from having undertaken site visits was that there is still a problem with the interaction of traffic between these, these respective junctions. Um, our roads colleagues are satisfied from it in terms of a, a, a technical analysis point of view, but I think there's a question about whether that reflects the reality um, when observed on the ground. And that seems to be uh, reflected also in the Bridge of Dawn Community Council's submission. Hopefully that's something. Does that help Councillor McDonald? Yes, certainly has, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Sandra. No. Right. Councillor Hendrickson, have you got? Uh, thank you, Kavina. No, my main concern, and it's just been answered, was uh, I was really just after a bit more detail on the on, on the traffic flow in the area. Um, it was mentioned that the, the the site that's under development at the moment is is, is a KFC. And I'm just wondering whether. <laughs> If there's any indication on how that will impact on the road conditions at the moment, um, mm -hmm. whether the roads actually see that make it uh, in increase the problems. Um, well, I think the the improvement works that have been undertaken were in anticipation of that KFC and related to its development. Um, so the the situation as it currently stands is likely only to be worsened by uh, the additional traffic that would be attracted to that use. And um, I think that's probably probably just just as plain as it is, really. Um, but, you know, the flip side of that being, of course, that our roads development management team have been satisfied that in terms of doing a, a sort of uh, a technical analysis using the, the standard methodologies for these things, these junctions should be operating within capacity. And um, so it's perhaps that driver behavior is not reflecting the assumptions that go into those methodologies. Um, so. um, again, have you any other questions, Councillor Hendrickson? No, okay. I, I mean, my, my, my question was on the same lines. I think that the, the, the difficulty we have is is that we haven't got an objection from our roads colleagues um and certainly the questioning by um elected members seems to be all about the road so we're kind of taking the community council's considerations i think and and trying to get to the bottom of it and i think that's why we're getting to this kind of questioning stage um is there any other questions for mr evans at this point no Okay, um, can I just ask, are we ready to go into discussion and determination? Councillor Hendrickson, you're first this time. <laughs> Thank you, Kavina. Um, yeah, I, I think the, 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 um, the issue with the roads is, is, is my primary concern. Um, I'm not convinced in the fact that if it's going to be another um, I, I was going to say footfall, but it, it won't be. It will be a car for um, attracting more cars into the area. Um, I, I've, I've looked at the area and I don't see how the, 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 the footfall is going to come from the local industrial area. I can only see that it's going to come from externally from that area. 
um, probably by the use of cars. And I think if there's a big enough problem at the moment at the junction, um, I would be going for refusal and upholding the, the officer's recommendations. Thank you, Councillor Hendrickson. Councillor McDonald. Yeah, I would I would uh, concur with that. I think um, this type of development does encourage travel um, th rather than to service the um, existing businesses around. And uh, and it is um, it is the case in my view that um, you know doing assessment of of alternative sites and so on would have been would have been useful for this case. Um, it is um, the design is 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 what it is. Um, but I think on on both on B1 and um, NC4 and therefore NC5, I think um, I would be um, I would be upholding the refusal of this this case, particularly the, the travel aspects. Um, again, I think it's you know we've, we've been faced with I think three quite difficult applications today in terms of determination. Um, you know, I think my my problem is there's. Whilst I accept the, the B1 um, policy used by officers to, to refuse it, I, again, I can see that there's also an opportunity within that policy to be able to sort this type of thing in terms of supporting the existing office base and, and people around it. However, I absolutely accept the argument that it will, by the nature of the, the, the uh, commodity being sold there, attract um, a large number of people um, to, to visit. Um, uh, I mean, we've seen a similar outlet, same outlet, but in a different location of the city, um, facing similar, which we, which did go through. However, I think we've got to look at the merits of this one. It, it, it is made harder the fact that we don't have an objection from the Rhodes colleagues. But again, I think you know desktop studies are very good, but they're limited in terms of the reality on the ground. Um, and and I think on again on a kind of a it was a, a rounded balance. I would uphold the officer's recommendation um, until really I think there would be, need to be far more clarity around for me that the roads element, which then you know feeds into that B1, because the argument there is you'd be attracting people out with the, the immediate zone so that your claiming would be su being supported. So you know there is absolute um or contrasting things there. So I think on balance, given that there is a level of doubt, um, I think it, it's absolutely appropriate to uphold the officer's recommendation. So can I just agree that, that Mr. Masson, if you could just get us to agree, obviously that it's the unanimous decision to uphold the officer's recommendation. Yeah, just confirming what you, you, you just said, uh, Councillor Bolton, um, the application um, is refused um, the officers um, decision has been upheld um, unanimously by three votes to nil. Yeah, agreed. 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 Okay. All right. Thank you all very much for today. As I say, you know, on the face of it, people think these these decisions are very easy and they're black and white. But as we've seen, there's various shades of grey in there, and and it, it can often be down to a balance call. But I think I think we've all worked really hard to get through this today. So thank you all, uh, yourself, Mr. Christie, Gavin, Mr. Evans. And uh, Mr. Masson and Shabin for doing the recording. So we'll now conclude the, the meeting for today and the recording will now stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Thanks. Thank you.